which has a lot to say about that. Um, and so uh, last uh, time we preached, uh, last time I preached on this topic, uh, we talked about um, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth. We talked about well, what, uh, where is your treasure? Um, we talked about laying up treasure in heaven and not treasure on earth. And of course, we know what that's talking about. Treasure in heaven, uh, you can't like take your um, money and put it in a rocket and take it out to space and throw it out of it. That's not how you get the money. The, uh, your treasure in heaven, you don't uh, you know, shoot it up uh, with an arrow or out of a gun or something. Um, that's not how you get treasure in heaven. The way that you get treasure in heaven is, is, is using your money for eternal things. Um, and so, of course, you need to provide for your family and you need to raise your family for the Lord. That is eternal. So even when you work and you buy the basic needs that your family has, that's eternal. But of course, that's not the, not the only thing that's eternal. When you, uh, when you uh, support missionaries and you support pastors and support churches, all of that is for getting people saved. And so that is also eternal. Um, and so we need to think about eternal things. How can I be sure that um, the way that I spend my finances will result, result in something eternal. Anything that's just on this earth, it's not like it's wrong, it's not a sin, but when you die, you can't take it with you when you go. You leave it here, it's not eternal. And so the Bible says where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Actually, I was wrong. Uh, I did preach on that, but then I preached on the light, uh, the, uh, um, about uh, the evil eye. And the Bible is basically saying that um, everything comes into your body through your eye. So how you look at the world, if you look at the world from e things from an eternal perspective, um, then you'll make good decisions. If thine eye be evil, thy whole body before it be full of darkness. But if thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. So we need to learn to look at things in of this world through a, a, an eternal perspective. That was actually the last message that I preached. Um, Gregory, you want to go out to the car and get? Oh, it's not supposed to. I'm supposed to give you a command. Uh, go out to the car and get me um, a bottle of water. There's some water behind your seat. Wow. There. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Yesterday. So, um, so today I'm preaching on Matthew six twenty four. Matthew six twenty four. Uh, just one verse, um, and I'll talk about Matthew six twenty four. So Matthew six twenty four uh, says this: No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So the title of the message today is, thank you, Gregory. The title of the message is, No Man Can Serve Two Masters. No man can serve two masters. Let's pray. Father in heaven, this is an important principle especially in our culture and our time. So many people are trying to serve more than one master, and yet it's impossible. You said in this passage that it is impossible. You cannot have two masters. You cannot serve two masters. And so, Father, I pray that you would teach us what it means, what you're trying to say, and that you would help us to make it um, applicable to our lives. It would be practical. And fill me with your spirit so that I can make your word clear. In Jesus' name, amen. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. And then he says this. Now he's going to take that principle and he's going to apply it to money. Mammon is money. He says you cannot serve God and mammon. So when I look at this verse, I divide it into basically three statements. The first is this. We must choose whom we will serve. That's number one. Number two is... This is important. Choosing involves priorities. Number three, serving two masters is not an option. Okay, so I'll repeat that again. We must, number one, we must choose whom we will serve. We must choose. You do not have a choice. You, have, you do not have a choice to not have a choice. You have to choose. You will be forced to choose. You must choose. We must choose whom we will serve, number one. Number two, you need to understand something about the choice. You've got to be careful which finger I hold up. <laughs> number one, number two, there we go, that works better. Number two, you must, so number one, we must choose whom we will serve. Number two, choosing involves priorities. Choosing involves priorities. Number three, serving two masters is not an option. That isn't an option. It isn't even possible. To serve two masters. 
it isn't possible. So first of all, we must choose whom we will serve. So Jesus says, no man can serve two masters. So that means you are going to have to choose whom you will serve. Every person in this room, you have to choose whom you'll serve. You don't have a choice to not make the choice. You will choose. You must choose. Now, you might say, well, I don't have to choose. But listen, refusing to choose is still making a choice. Refusing to choose is still making a choice. And I want to show you that from Joshua chapter 24. So Joshua chapter 24. This is one of the most famous chap uh, verses in the Bible. Joshua 24, 15. But if I asked anyone here to... Tell me, Joshua 24, 15, from memory, I know what you would do. You would only quote part of it. And you know what? If you asked me, don't feel bad, because if you asked me to quote Joshua 24, 15, I would only quote part of it. What's the only part of Joshua 24, 15 that everybody knows is, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's a great verse. I mean, that's a wonderful verse. I preached a message called the best father, a Father's Day message one time called the greatest father in the Bible. And I believe Joshua was the greatest father in the Bible because he said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He decided for his family that they were going to serve the Lord. That's what a father is supposed to do. He's not supposed to be, um, honey, what do you think? Uh, children, what do you think? You think we should serve the Lord today or not? No, no, no. A real father says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He decided for his family that they were going to serve the Lord. That's leadership. I believe Joshua is the greatest father in the Bible because of that. But that's not the message today. That was the choice that Joshua made. But if you look at Joshua 24, 15, I want you to see the whole verse. And there's something very interesting about this verse. Remember, refusing to choose is still making a choice. Now listen, Joshua 24, 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, Joshua's talking to the children of Israel, if you think it's a bad idea to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve. Did you know in that verse, when Joshua said, choose you this day whom you will serve, he didn't actually say choose between God and idols. That's not what the verse says. Look at it. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. You know, when Joshua said, choose you this day whom ye will serve, he wasn't telling them to choose between God and idols. He said, if you're not going to serve God, listen, you still have to choose. I want you to understand that from the passage. Joshua said, if it seems evil to serve the Lord your God, choose him. You're going to serve. Are you going to serve the gods that are from Egypt? Or are you going to serve the gods of this land? Now, that's kind of odd when you think about it. Why in the world would Joshua say, remember when we study on Thursday night and we looked at their, their journey, right? We're in, in Deuteronomy. We're looking at their journey. They left Egypt and they worshiped the golden calf. Remember? That was from Egypt, the golden calf. And then they go up, and then they go to the promised land. Now Joshua is going to die, and the promised land is conquered. And Joshua says, if you decide that you're not going to serve God, choose whom you're going to serve. Are you going to serve the gods of the Amorites in, these, in this land which you dwell, or are you going to serve the gods that, that, were, that are in Egypt, the gods from the other side of the flood, the other side of the river Jordan? You're going to, which, which, which god are you going to serve? It's interesting. Joshua didn't say choose between God and them. He said if it seems evil to choose God, then choose whom you're going to serve. Which God are you going to serve? You know what Joshua was telling them? Refusing to choose is still making a choice. He was telling them, even if you don't serve God, you are going to have to serve someone, and you're going to have to choose whom you're going to serve. Not choosing is not an option. Listen, I want everybody here to know this. I want the young people to know this. If you say, you grow up, you say, I'm not going to serve God anymore. I'm going to do whatever I want. Did you know that you are still choosing whom you're going to serve? You're either going to serve yourself, and you are going to be your own God, and you're going to make some really bad decisions if you do that. You're going to make decisions that you regret. Or you're going to serve your favorite Hollywood celebrity, or your favorite rock and roll singer, 
Or are you going to serve your friends? Or are you going to serve something? You will serve something. Refusing to choose is still making a choice. And Joshua was saying, if you're not going to serve God, choose whom you're going to serve. Because even if you don't still serve God, you still have to choose. Refusing to choose is still making a choice. So that's point number one. Listen, we must choose whom we will serve. You have to choose. You don't have the option of not choosing. Because even if you choose not to serve God, I'm not going to choose that, you will still have to choose to serve something. You refusing to choose is still making a choice. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. We must choose whom we will serve. But now, number two, choosing involves priorities. Look at what Jesus says. It's very interesting. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Listen, choosing involves priorities. Choosing involves priorities. I'll give an example with my job. I have two jobs. Well, see there, Pastor, you just, pro you just proved that you can serve two masters. Because on Sunday and on Saturday and on Thursday, you work for the church. And on Friday, you work for Cardinals. So that, voila, you're serving two masters. No, I'm not. Did you know that if Cardinal tells me to come to work on Sunday, I'm going to say no. Because the church is actually my master. Hopefully it's God, but it's still the church is here meeting. I'm not going to switch. How would you like it if every week I'm like, okay, my Cardinal schedule has changed this week, so this week we're going to have church on Tuesday. <laughs> oh, Cardinal changed my schedule again, so now on we're going to have church on Friday. Okay, next week, oh, I'm going to have church on Wednesday. Oh, this week is going to be Thursday. That's not going to work. So I told Cardinal before I went there, here are the days I'm available. Here are days I'm not available. And you know what? I actually told, I, I told a young guy this one time. I said, uh, there is one thing that would happen here at work, and you would know that I wasn't a pastor anymore. What would it be? And he couldn't think of it. I said, if I showed up for work on Sunday morning, <laughs> you would know, well, he's obviously not pastoring. I mean, unless I had someone to fill in for me, I guess. But you would know that I'm not pastoring if I'm a church Sunday morning. You know why? Because Sunday morning, the church is my master. Or hopefully, God is my master. Okay? You can't serve two masters. But what, is, what does it mean to choose? Choosing involves priorities. Look what Jesus said. He will, either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. So Jesus says... You can't serve two masters, and he tells you why, because choosing involves priorities. Listen, if I go work at Cardinal on Sunday, you don't have a pastor. So you know what? You're going to come to church and go like, oh, I guess he doesn't care about us. I'm holding to them and despising you. On the other hand, Cardinal calls me and says, can you come to work today on Sunday? And I say, no, I'm sorry, i got a pastor. You know what Cardinal's going to say? I guess he doesn't care about us. Either way. Somebody's going to be despised. How do I decide? Do I get up every Sunday morning and go, should I go to Cardinal or should I go to church? Should I go to Cardinal or should I go to church? Is that what I do every Sunday morning? Roll the dice. Spin the arrow. Flip a coin. Heads, Cardinals. Tails, church. Oh, heads. Send out a text. Sorry, I flipped a coin. <laughs> I went to Cardinal today. <laughs> no. I have priorities. I'm going to show up in church no matter what, Sunday morning, unless I'm sick or something goes, something stops me physically from getting here. I'm always going to be here. I'm always going to be here. Hey, one time I came here, and you guys all voted to send me home because I was pretty sick, remember? That was but I was, Thursday. that was on a Thursday. You're right, but not the same way as Thursday. Thursday is the same way. Yeah. So you know what? Even though you let me go home, I still showed up even that day, right? So that was my priority, right? Ever since all of you have been here, unless I plan ahead and get someone to fill in for me, every Sunday morning, you know I'm going to be here. Every Thursday, even if I haven't slept in three days and I'm feeling sick and falling asleep standing up, <laughs> that day that we, I, mean, I was moving that day and I'd been up most of the night and, and uh, I think I'd gotten really no sleep at all that night and then I was driving the U-Haul to get our stuff down and everything. And I came in, we were doing prayer requests, and while we were praying, I was literally like, 
barely able to stand up. And then you guys are like, Pastor, go home. But I was here. You know why? Now listen, it's priority. If I don't show up, then you're not the priority. The church isn't the priority, right? But the same way with Cardinal. Cardinal, I've agreed with them. I'm going to come on, on Friday. You know, I get invited to all kinds of events from churches and pastors on Friday. And I say I'm working for Cardinal. So on the, that day, I'm like, Cardinal's the priority. So listen, this is what's important. Choosing involves priorities. Jesus said he'll either hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Somebody's going to feel left out. I can't be at Cardinal and hear both. Somebody's going to feel left out. And Jesus is explaining that. You know, really, this is kind of basic. It's obvious, but you would be amazed. You would be amazed at how often we, as Christians, think we can serve two masters. We can't. No man can serve two masters. No man can serve two masters. No one can serve two masters. It's impossible. We, number one, we must choose and we will serve. Number two, choosing involves priorities. Now, here is a, remember the statement I made about we must choose and we will serve? Refusing to choose is still making a choice. It was still making a choice. But now I want to have a statement about this one. Choosing creates tension between conflicting priorities. Okay? I know that sounds like a complex statement. Just pay attention to it. Choosing creates tension between conflicting priorities. So, for example, if somebody wants me to do something on Friday, I can't because I'm choosing Cardinal. If somebody, if Cardinal wants me to come to work on Sunday morning, I can't because I'm choosing the church. Choosing creates tension between conflicting priorities. Now, here's where you and I struggle. The world is full of voices that are clamoring for, clamoring for us and for our time and for our money and for our resources and for our attention. And we feel this constant tension between conflicting priorities. Listen, that is reality. Your whole life, you will be forced to choose, and that choice will create tension between conflicting priorities. How do I know there's tension? Look at the wording he uses here. You will hate the one, and I'm going to explain that word hate in a minute. You will hate the one master and love the other master, or you will hold to the one master and despise the other. Do you notice how Jesus told us? Every day, you get up and you choose and there is always going to be a tension between your conflicting priorities. That's part of life. And Jesus says, you can't choose two masters. You must choose. And the choosing creates tension. Choosing involves priorities. Listen, folks, Jesus Christ is telling us something really basic. He's going to apply it to money, and we'll get there. But first, Jesus Christ is talking, telling you something really basic that you, we, you and I need to get in our minds. He's saying, you have to choose who you serve. You can't say, I'm not going to choose. I'm just going to get up every day and do whatever. No, you're still choosing. If you get up in the morning and you decide not to go to church, you're serving whatever is the thing that kept you away from church. You get up in the morning, you decide not to go to work, you're serving whatever kept you away from work. Or you go to work, you're serving that instead of the other thing you want to do. You have to choose. We must choose who we will serve. Number one, you can't avoid choosing. And number two, choosing involves priorities. Choosing creates tension between conflicting priorities. Listen, you will choose, and your choice will be on what's most important to you. That's it. You will choose, and choosing will be based on what is most important to you. Choosing creates tension between conflicting priorities. Now, what about when it says hate the one and love the other? Like, so think about it. Like on Sunday morning, a cardinal called me up and said, we need you at work. We've got a, a crisis. You know, they actually called a couple of weeks ago, and they were like, we, something that they know what that means. They were, we lost the ribbon, and they literally called everybody in to work. But can you imagine if they, every single employee was there helping because they lost the ribbon? They have to have the ribbon of glass running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And they lost the ribbon. They had a problem with the furnace and everything, lost the ribbon. And it took them five days. There's going to be no profit sharing this month because it took them five days to get the ribbon back. Okay? These are emergencies that happen. You know, It's kind of like if you are a paramedic, right? An EMT. Your phone goes off. You drop everything. If you're on call, you have to go. And there's an accident. What if you're a doctor? You're on call, and, and it's an emergency room. You know, That's your priority. You have to go do that. You have to follow after. You have to do that. Um, so 
it said Jesus said he'll hate the one and love the other. Cardinal wants me. If my phone rang right now and Cardinal asked me to come in, I would be like, no. And they'd be like, well, we need you. And I'd be like, sorry. And you know what? That's what the word hate means. It's I love the church and God and my calling. And so I'm just setting aside Cardinal. I'm treating them like they're not important. Right now, they're not important. If they were important, I'd be there. That's how the choice works. That's why it's hard for us to choose. Because when we choose, we are constantly saying, this is more important than this. And somebody will always be unhappy with your choice. Because when you choose church, somebody who wants you to be away from church is going to be bad at you. When you choose this job, somebody else who wants you to do something else is going to be upset at you. It's constant. Choosing creates tension between conflicting priorities. And Jesus actually named some of these tensions. And uh, first I want you to turn to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 27. Jesus is describing the tensions. See, here's the problem you and I have. Because people can make our lives miserable if we don't please them. You know what we do, don't we? Most often... We make people the priority because they can make our lives miserable if we don't please them. But God, he's just the easiest one to neglect and set aside because he doesn't really seem to bother us if we just ignore him and leave him alone. So God becomes the one who, what are we doing? We're choosing. And the people, like the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? The people who are the loudest in our lives, the most pushy, the most dominant, the most pressuring, or that can make our lives the most miserable, we spend, we arrange our entire life around those priorities, and God always gets second place. But the Bible says you will create tension, and the Bible tells you to choose God, and it's okay if there's tension with everybody else. That's what the Bible teaches. So look at Luke 14, 25 through 27. Luke 14, 25 through 27. And there went great multitudes with him. Now, we don't have a problem with that at Dells Baptist, do we? We have great multitudes here. But I want to show you what Jesus said when huge crowds of people followed him. This is amazing. He didn't seem to know how to win friends and influence people. There went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them. You know, I, you would think Jesus would say, oh, we got a mega church. Um, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, make sure everybody gets a bulletin. We're going to have a potluck afterwards. All you can eat, loaves and fish. <laughs> um, let's, uh, we need to build a building for this crowd of people. And let's make sure we have a nursery and a Sunday school. And uh, we don't have a bus ministry, but you can ride the wagon to church. Hey, everybody, make sure that you dress nice. Make sure you make everybody feel welcome. Greet one another while the music is playing. I'm not making fun of any of that. That's what we do in our culture, and that's fine. We do it too. There's nothing wrong with that. But instead of saying all that, we're so glad that you're all here. Jesus says, if any man, he says he turned and said unto them, if any man come to me, listen to this, and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now this is amazing because they didn't know that Jesus was going to die on the cross. Did you know that? They thought that Jesus was going to be a great king and set up his kingdom. By the way, he's still going to set up his kingdom. That's in the millennium. That's in the future. But first, according to the Old Testament prophets, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he's afflicted. He opened not his mouth. The Bible says that Jesus was going to die first, but they didn't understand that. And after all, if you have to pick between a belief that says Jesus is going to come to you king and, and set up a kingdom and you're going to be important in his kingdom or a belief that says Jesus is going to die on the cross, obviously, which one are you going to pick to believe, right? So they didn't even know Jesus was going to die on the cross. Crucifixion was something that the Romans did. They were Jews. And Jesus said, if you come after me, you're going to have to carry a cross. 
He's saying that you're going to have to be crucified if you follow me. Whoa! <laughs> Welcome to our church service. Did you get a brochure? Dell's Baptist Church. At our church, we believe that everyone who follows us has to be nailed to a cross and die. You want to join? <laughs> Fill out the slip. Put it in the offering. <laughs> no wonder we're so small. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first time I did that, by the way. <laughs> Folks, we can laugh. But that is what happens when you follow Jesus. You may not be crucified physically, and not everybody Jesus was talking to did get physically crucified. But you are going to have to choose your priorities. And you are going to suffer. The people who got left out, the people who you didn't do what they wanted because you were doing what God wanted, they are going to persecute you. They are going to crucify you. Some physically, some literally, some spiritually, some figuratively. They are going to get angry at you. And they are going to say, you don't care about us. You only care about church and God. They're going to do that. Hey, it's unavoidable. We must choose who we will serve, and choosing involves priorities. See, Jesus doesn't let us get away with, well, I don't know, I'll just kind of make up my life as I go and see what happens. He goes, no, that's a choice. And he says, choosing involves priorities. If you try to serve two masters, so here's one master, and he's another master, you're going to either hate the one and love the other, or you're going to hold the one despise the other. You know why? Because you can't do both. You know, it's interesting. He says, if you don't hate your father. Wait a minute. Jesus also taught honor your father and mother. So why is he talking about hate? Hey, listen. In the Bible, the word hate doesn't mean what we mean today when we say hate. In the Bible, the word hate means, listen, it's you're in opposition to someone. That's what hate means. You're in opposition. So if, okay, so when he says... If you don't hate your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brethren, and your sisters, and your own life, and your own life. Did you know sometimes choosing to serve God is going to cost you your life? So you will literally have to be in opposition, listen, to your own life to serve God. You have to choose. There are places in the world where they hold a gun to your head, say, deny your faith, we're going to shoot you. And you know what? You have to hate your life and say, no. Boom. Or you can't follow Jesus. That's what he said. Your father, your mother, your wife. Wait, how would you hate your wife? Not talking about hate the way we use the word hate today. It means opposition. Well, what is the opposition? Well, it's only if your wife, this is why young people, it's so important to marry. If you marry a godly Christian, you will never have to hate them because they're serving the same master as you. But he's talking to people who are already married and they have to choose to follow Jesus and they don't know if their spouse is going to come along for the ride. They don't know if their father is going to agree with their decision to follow Jesus. They don't know if their mother is going to agree. They don't know if their brothers or their sisters or even their children are going to agree with what they're doing. There are many places in the world people get saved. They, their wife leaves them and they takes the children. Or their husband leaves them and takes the children. And they lose everything to follow Jesus. Oh well, I'll just be a secret Christian. Some people are. In Saudi Arabia. Or in Iran. Okay, you're going to be a secret Christian. What are you going to do when they tell you to say, there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet? That's literally something you have to say like five times a day to be a Muslim. What are you going to do when they tell you to do something that's wrong? If you obey it, who's your master? God's not your master anymore. Those people are. You have to choose. You have to choose. You have to choose to follow Jesus. You have to choose. And to refusing to choose is still a choice. And a choosing involves priorities. You see, you have to decide what is more important. Jesus Christ or my life? 
Jesus Christ or my parents' opinion? Jesus Christ or my children's opinion? Jesus Christ and my spouse that doesn't believe in Jesus Christ? You will have to choose, and choosing involves priorities. That's why Jesus said, Welcome to Galilee Baptist Church. Fill out the sheet of paper if you want to take up your cross and hate everyone in your own life and die. <laughs> That's why he said that. Because he's being honest with them. He's telling the truth. You have to choose. You can't avoid choosing. And that's what the title of the message is. No man can serve two masters. No man can serve two masters. You can't serve two masters. We must choose and we will serve. And choosing involves priorities. You are going to have to decide who is most important. God or someone else. God or something else. You will have to decide. Number one, we must choose and we will serve. Number two, choosing involves priorities. Number three, serving two masters is not an option. Serving two masters is not an option. He says this, ye cannot serve God and man. You know, there's a lot of verses in the Bible that say cannot. And we, in our minds, we read it as should not. You know that? It's funny. It's funny how human nature is, but one of the reasons why you need to always read the Bible with an open mind and literally like blank out the last time you read the verse is because very often you'll read a passage and you'll put a word in there that's not in there. You'll make it say what it's not saying. John Rice, one of my favorite writers, one of my favorite preachers, he says this. He says most people do not, their doctrine is not based on what the Bible actually says. It's based on the impression that they had about what it says and not what it actually says. It's very important to look what it actually says. Jesus said, ye cannot serve God and mammon. He did not say you should not serve God and mammon. He said you cannot. You cannot. It's like there's another verse. People often read it wrong, or in their mind they interpret it wrong. It says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. He said it cannot. He didn't say should not. See, here's how people who... You know, sometimes people will attend church for a while and then they'll get offended or bothered by something or whatever and they'll leave the church and they won't go to another church. And they'll say, you know, I don't really need those people. But the Bible doesn't say that you should not say that. So when we think, oh, well, they shouldn't be saying that. No, it's they cannot say it. What do you mean they can't say it? They can't say the words? Well, they can say the words, but they can't actually say it and it be true. You need other Christians. We need the body of Christ. You cannot say, I have no need of thee. Because you do. You know why? Because the Bible says one person is a foot, one person is a hand, one person is an eye, one person is an ear. Can you say, I don't need my eyes? Of course not. I mean, you can say it, the words come out of my but is it true? Of course you need your eyes. Watch me poke them out and see how we get around. Get around. You need your eyes, right? Can you say, I don't need my legs? I don't need my hands? I don't need my ears? No. You cannot say it. It's not that you should not. It's that you cannot say it. You can't say it and it be true. But listen, that's same here. Jesus says, ye cannot serve God and mammon. He doesn't say you should not. See, the problem that you and I have, see, Jesus is taking this doctrine now, and he's making it practical. He's applying it to money. And he's saying, you can't serve God and money. you got to choose. You can't. Serving two masters is not an option. That's point number three. Serving two masters is not an option. I'm going to use an illustration for this. Listen, when two masters conflict, a decision must be made. When two masters conflict, a decision must be made. So, for example, Sunday morning, if Cardinal called me, and they want me to come to work, and you all are planning to come to church, is that two different things that conflict? The church and Cardinal, a decision has to be made. I can't go to Cardinal and church. I have to make a decision. You cannot serve God and heaven. Serving two masters is not an option. When two masters conflict, a decision must be made. I want you to turn to 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. When two masters conflict, a decision must be made. You cannot. Not you should not, but you can't. You actually can't serve two masters. One of them is going to have to be chosen over the other. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. 
And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Now listen. He said, How long halt ye between two opinions? So you know to halt is to stop, right? Or to stumble. So, Paul, uh, uh, not Paul, Elijah, a little bit early, a little, little different time period than Paul. He says, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. Now look, to halt is to go. That's what the children of Israel were doing. Am I going to follow God or am I going to follow Baal? Paul, uh, uh, <laughs> why do I keep saying Paul? <laughs> Elijah said, pick. Pick. You can't do both. Pick. We must choose and we will serve. Choosing involves priorities. Serving two masters is not an option. They couldn't serve God and Baal. How long halt ye between two opinions? The people answered him not a word. They're like, oh, uh, I don't know. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under, and I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under. And call ye on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. So, I <laughs> keep wanting to say Paul. Elijah... <laughs> says, Paul stood on Bar's hill and said, how long now? <laughs> Elijah says, we're going to make an altar. You pray, fire comes, follow Baal. I'm going to pray, fire comes, then you follow God. Are you going to pick now? Will you pick? And, and it says, and all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Okay, that's a good way. He said, we're going to do a test. And then whatever happens, we're going to follow that God. And Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves, and dress it first, for ye are many, and call on the name of your gods, and put no fire under. And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and called the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awakened. So he's making fun of them because they keep praying and praying and no fire comes, okay? And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. By the way, are there people today that cut themselves? Yes. Guess who's behind that? The false gods, the devil, is behind that, okay? The devil hates your body. He hates the kind of the, that you were created in the image of God. He wants you to hurt yourself. And it came to pass when midday was past, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that there was neither any, neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. Now listen to me. I want to tell you something, especially young people. There's a million false gods out there, the gods of this world, what everybody lives for, everybody follows. And they will talk to you and say, come follow these gods. You know why? Because these gods will let you do whatever they want. You know, the Baal, the, the people who follow Baal, they could do whatever they wanted, right? But listen, at the end of the day, you follow any false gods other than God. We, well, how do I know which God is real? Because in the Bible, there's fulfilled prophecy, and Jesus rose from the dead. And all of those other gods, when they die, they're dead. They never come back. So we know which God is a real God. It's the God of the Bible. So listen to me. Here's what I want you to know. What's going to happen is you're going to follow after those gods and follow after those gods because you can't serve God and man. You can't serve God and another God. You're going to follow after those gods, but what's going to end up happening is in the end, you will just hurt yourself and you'll have no meaning and purpose in life. And it will all be empty. All that pleasure, all that, all that happiness you looked for, your life will be empty, and you'll there'll be no answer. There'll be no answer. It says there was no answer. There was no answer. It says there was any voice, neither voice nor any to answer, nor any that regarded, and you will end up feeling alone, betrayed, and like your life has no meaning and purpose. That's all the gods of this world can offer you. So Elijah says, um, let's decide who is the real God. 
And it came to pass, when midday was past, I already read that, verse 30, And Elijah said unto the people, Come near unto me. And the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood and said, Fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, Do it the second time. And they did it the second time. He said, Do it the third time. They did it the third time. And the water ran round about the altar and he filled the trench also with water. Now, listen. Elijah is making sure that they know there's no tricks here. There was water all over the wood, all over the, 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 the animal that was sacrificed. And it ran down the whole wa- the whole altar was just drenched with water, and there was water in the trench all the way around about. So he was going to prove that God was the real God. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, and that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. It all got burned up. Even the stones burned up. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. So Elijah said, you have to choose. There's Baal and there's God. You have to choose. And listen, today we all have to choose. Which God are we going to serve? Which God are we going to follow? And here's what I want you to know about all the gods of this world. Baal represents the devil and all the gods of this world. All the gods of this world will not satisfy you. They will never answer your prayers. They will never give you meaning and purpose. All that you will end up is frustration and heartache and meaninglessness and emptiness. And our culture has been following the gods of this world. And that is the reason that now suicide is up 35% in the last 20 years. And among young people, it has gone up 400% in the last 15, 20 years. It's because they're following the gods of this world, and the gods of this world cannot answer your prayers, cannot help you, can't give you meaning and purpose in life, gives you no sense of worth, and still makes you hate yourself and want to hurt yourself. And there's no meaning and purpose in life. But listen, I want you to think about this. When you came to Jesus Christ, when you got saved, and there was a fire that came into your heart, and burned up all the things of this world. It didn't matter anymore to you. And you knew that you were saved. And you knew your name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And you knew that your life had meaning and purpose. And God loves you. And we love you. And you need to remember when you were saved. You need to remember when the fire of God burned in your heart. When you were went to the altar. Uh, when you were at a youth conference or at a church service. And God changed you. And you read the Bible. And the Bible came alive. And it spoke to you. Just like the disciples disciples on the road to Emmaus, they said, did not our heart burn within us when he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? You got meaning and purpose in your life and everything made sense. I love what C.S. Lewis says. He says, I believe in Christianity for the same reason that I believe in the sun. Not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. See, when you're a Christian, God changes you. And gives your life meaning and purpose. And his Holy Spirit comes to live inside you and gives you meaning and purpose. And God hears and answers your prayer. He's a real, real God. And he loves you. And he wants what's best for you. But you are going to have to choose. You cannot serve Baal and God. And how do you choose who to serve? Well, Elijah said, the God who answers by fire, let him be God. And what did that fire do? It burned everything up, and it was miraculous. And there was no answer from Baal. And God is the God who answers by fire. He's the one that sets your heart and your life on fire. And he is the one who gives your life meaning and purpose. Amen. Amen. But you know what the devil's going to do? 
he goes away and hides. When you're reading your Bible and you're excited about your faith, when you're sharing the gospel with your friends, when you are going to church services and revival meetings and youth conference, and when you're singing the great hymns of the faith and you're in church, he runs off and hides because he can't do anything when that happens. But then he comes back later and he says this. That's all nice. All that God stuff. I'm a Christian. I'm saved. I read my Bible once in a while. I don't get all fanatical about it. You know, you don't get so into it, you know, but I do it. I don't like judge other people, but I do it. But the devil says this. You can serve God and fail. You can serve God and man. See, he's not going to get you to outright reject God at first. He's just going to say, you can do both. But it's a lie. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other, he will hold the one and despise the other. Now listen, listen. If you love something other than God, you're hating God. If you're holding on to something other than God, you are despising God. I didn't say that. Jesus said it. If you didn't believe that you can be a Christian and serve all these other gods, you are calling Jesus Christ a liar. I didn't say this. I'm just the messenger. Jesus is the one who said this. No man can serve two masters. And he says you cannot serve God and mammon. When two masters conflict, a decision must be made. We as Christians have to make a decision. What are we going to serve? Are we going to serve God or mammon? Now, Jesus makes it practical. You know, Jesus could have said, you can't serve two masters. Be careful. You can't serve God and something else. But, you know, he didn't say you can't serve God and something else. He said you can't serve God and mammon. And mammon is money. You can't serve God and money. Well, I wonder why Jesus said you can't serve God and money. Does that mean that we all have to give up all of our money? You know, that's what some people thought. In years past, there are people who said... I'm going to give up everything I own and just become a beggar and walk the streets. I'm going to join a monastery. I'm not going to own any money. The Hutterites believe that. They, they join the community and they give up all their money and they don't own anything. So I can't serve God in money, so I have to give up all my money. No, it's not that you can't have money. It's that you can't serve money. Everybody has money. Everybody uses money. But you have to serve God, not money. But what does it mean to serve? Ser choosing involves priorities. Right? Serving is about priorities. And when two masters conflict, a decision must be made. So, I'll give you some examples. You have to choose between spending all your money and tithing. You have to choose. Because the Bible says, the Lord hath ordained that they which preach the gospel should live the gospel. The way that we spread the gospel to the world, the way that um, preachers are supported, the way that missionaries are sent out, the way that churches are established is through 10% of our income to the local New Testament church. So that's a choice. Am I going to spend that 10% or am I going to give it to the Lord? How about work in church is another example. Work in church. So there's going to be times where I have to choose between work and church. Now, some people would say you should never have a job that works Sunday. You know, I don't actually believe that. Now, here's why. How would you like it if all of, if on Sunday somebody broke into your house and you tried to call 911 and all of the policemen were in church? I said, no, can't serve God and mammon. If I'm out driving and patrolling the streets, then I'm serving mammon, not God. So sorry, everybody, right? That wouldn't work, right? How would you like it if you got in a car accident and you go to the emergency room and there's nobody there to take care of you because it's a Sunday and all the doctors are in church, right? And so you can think, you think about it. There's a lot of jobs that you have to work on Sunday. So that's not really it. But the tension between work and church is this. Is the Bible does say not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. It doesn't say which day, but you need to be in church with God's people. So what you need to do, most people can work a job where they don't have to work Sundays. But there are some jobs you have to work Sunday. Even Cardinal Glass, because they run that ribbon 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I obviously can't do that, but somebody has to. Okay? But here's what we have to do. 
we have to obey God's command to not forsake the assembling ourselves together. Now, if the command was go to church on Sunday, then we would have to say we can't work a job on Sunday, right? But that's not the command. The command is not forsaking the assembling. It's not not forsaking the Sunday, not forsaking the assembly. God commands you to be in church, but he doesn't command which day you have to be in church. And so what you would need to do is if you have to work a Sunday, make sure you're in church on Thursday. If you have to work on Thursday, make sure you're in church on Sunday, right? And for example, in our church, that's our schedule, okay? So what you need to do is make sure that you're not forsaking the assembling. Make sure you're always assembling. But is it possible that there could be a job that they require you to work every single time that, you, that the church is available, you are, are working? Well then, okay, now listen. So let's say there's a job, and you believe the Lord wants you here at Dallas Baptist Church. It's different if it was a, another church. Maybe they meet on, on Wednesdays. Some church have Wednesday meetings, right? Some church have other, other times. Saturdays, different times. Okay, but let's say this is your church, and you have a choice Thursday and Sunday, and the job says you have to work Thursday night and Sunday morning. Okay, at that point, you know what you're going to have to do? You are going to have to choose whom he will serve. You can't serve two masters. God says, not forsaking the assembling. And the job says, forsaking the assembling. You're either going to make the job mad, or you're going to make God mad. You can't not make anyone mad. You know, there's a saying, if you try to please everybody, you please nobody. You have to choose whom you're going to serve. And Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And, but listen, do you know that if you choose the job that works Thursday and Sunday instead of God, here's how you're going to think of it. You're going to think of it as I'm choosing work over church, but it's not. Because why, what is the reason why you're working the job? To make money. Yeah. And what is the reason you're going to church? God, not the pastor, not the congregation. You're going to church for God because God says, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. So listen, the devil will deceive you into thinking you're choosing work over church. But really, you're choosing mammon over God. Mammon over God. So number one, spending and tithing is one example. Work in church is another example. Money and sin is another example. Money and sin. So what if you get a job? You know, I mean, it's an extreme example, but what if the only way you can make money is prostitution? <laughs> Obviously, no. <laughs> right? Okay. Or what if the only way you can make money is stealing? What if the only way, way you can make money is lying? Are there a lot of occupations nowadays that involve lying to make money? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Then if you choose to do that job and you say, oh, I just need to feed my family, so I'm going to have to become a prostitute. I just need to feed my family, so I'm going to have to steal. I just need to feed my family, so I'm going to have to lie. You are not choosing between money and sin. You're choosing between God and money. Because God commands you not to do it. And you're saying you have to do it to feed your family. So what are you doing? Remember the Bible says, don't you don't hate your father and mother, your wife, your own children. You can't be my disciple. You know why? You're going to have to choose between God and mammon. Here's another example. Money and marriage. Money and marriage? Why would I have to choose between money and marriage? Okay, does the Bible say that they are no more twain but one flesh? What therefore God hath joined together, let man not put asunder? Does the Bible forbid you to get divorced? You have to stay faithful till death do us part. Yes. Okay, so if the Bible forbids divorce and you get a job making money and it's causing a problem for your marriage and your marriage is suffering because of your job and you keep working that job and keep so you can get the money, listen. Well, my spouse just needs to be more understanding. No, you need to obey God and find a different job. Because God commands you to make your marriage a priority. And if you make making money a priority over marriage, you are choosing mammon instead of God. 
That's why Jesus said, you cannot serve God and Mammon. Not you should not, but you cannot. If you pick the money over your marriage, you are actually picking the money over God because you're not obeying God. What is a master? Someone you obey. If you're disobeying God to work that job because you're damaging your marriage, you are choosing money over God. One more example, money and children. Money and children. Does the Bible say, fathers, bring your children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? Provoke not your children to wrath, bring them up. The Bible commands parents, parents as well, all, you know, thou shalt teach them diligently to thy children. My son, um, um, uh, uh, honor thy father and mother. <laughs> the, uh, there's a, a verse I'm thinking of. It says, um, uh, these words, like command thee this day, shall be in thine heart. Thou shalt teach them diligently to thy children. For um, my son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. I am mindful of the sincere faith which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am excited that in thee also. So does God command the father and mother to raise their children in the faith? <laughs> but what if they're both working and they're too busy to actually raise their children in the faith? Or what if even one of them is too busy working, even just the father, and they're not teaching their children the faith. They're not spending time with their children. They're not teaching their, and leading their children to Christ. You know what they're doing? God commands you to raise your children for God, to spend time with your children and teach them God's word. God commands you to do that. And if you are unable to do it because of your job, you are choosing mammon over God. This is very practical, folks. Jesus said... We must choose and we'll serve. Choosing involves priorities, and serving two masters is not an option. And then he made it practical. He said, you cannot serve God and mammon. No man can serve two masters. You know I said choosing creates tension between conflicting priorities. Think about it. If you need that money and you've got to go work a job that doesn't pay as well so that you can work on your marriage or so that you can be in church or so that you can avoid sinning or so that you can raise your children for God, there's a tension, isn't there? There's a conflict. you got to pick. Are you going to obey God or are you going to obey mammon? You have to choose. Decisions made for money, listen, will conflict with decisions made for God. There will be a conflict. Listen. Refusing to choose is still making a choice. Choosing creates tension between conflicting priorities. There is a tension. You can't avoid it. And when two masters conflict, a decision must be made. Many years ago, I owned a farmhouse in North Dakota. And I, uh, I wanted to sell it. So I had neighbors that I knew that I knew wanted the property. So I called them up. And I talked to them about a price, and we agreed on a price that we were going to sell it to them. Now, we hadn't, didn't know anything in writing. It wasn't like an offer. We weren't, it wasn't going through a realtor. I just told them about it, and they agreed, you know, and they were going to figure out how they were going to get the money, and they were going to pay me. So we agreed on a price. But then uh, another neighbor who was very wealthy, who did not like those other neighbors, came to me, and that neighbor said, I will give you a lot more money for the property. In fact, they were going to pay me about 30% more. So it was a significant amount of money. So I had to decide what I was going to do. Well, there really was no decision. <laughs> I had already promised. Does the Bible say that if you, if you say something, you have to do it? The Bible says you have to keep your promises. Yes. We're not supposed to lie. We're not supposed to go against our go back on our word. So I told them, well, I just want you to know I already promised it to, that, to these neighbors. Well, I'm offering you more, so you tell them you're not going to get it. I said, well, I actually already told them that they could have the property, so I can't actually change my word. But I said, I'll tell you what I can do. I can go talk to them and tell them and ask them if they still want the property. And if they still want the property, I sell them, but if they decide they don't, they're okay with it, then you can buy it. That's fine. But I'll, I'll just go tell them. So I went and I talked to them, and they said, no, we still want the property. So I did tell them because this was the person, you know, wealthy people sometimes, they think that they own the world, you know. He actually, this person actually said, um, live stream is, be careful what I say. This, this was years and years ago, though. But this person said that they could make their life miserable, whoever bought that property, because they lived right next door to the property. 
So I knew that there was going to be trouble if this wealthy person didn't get the property. So I just said one to these friends of mine that I was selling to, one thing you might want to consider is that he, this person might not be a very pleasant neighbor because they're angry that you're getting the property and they want to get it. So they're going to make your life miserable if you buy the property instead of them. No, we still want the property. And I said, well, that's fine. I promised it to you. You can have it. You know. So then this person comes back and says, so what happened? Did you talk to them? I said, yeah, they said they still want the property. So I'm sorry. I have to keep my word. And that person, I saw them change. Like they turned into my enemy. They said, this person said, well, you know, my wife said that you're not going to do any more work for her. Money. This person was offering me a lot more money. I lost that by keeping my word. Then that the person's wife gave me a lot of woodworking business. She doesn't ever want to talk to you again because you betrayed us. <laughs> and I'm going to call the health department and have them come and inspect your property because I saw some skunks that were on your property. And your property is actually an eyesore and it's and I looked at that person and I thought to myself, I didn't say this. I was just like, well, I'm sorry, I didn't promise it to them. I'm sorry, it didn't work out. And he just got in his car and drove off in a huff. And I remember thinking to myself, well, I'm almost glad I didn't sell it to you now that I see your real character. <laughs> when you don't get your way, I find out what you're really like. I didn't, obviously didn't say that. That's what I was thinking. But I had people tell me, you're crazy. They offered you so much more money, you should have sold them. I said, well, I already promised it to them. Yeah, but, you know, the highest bidder, it doesn't matter. Just tell my sorry, I told you I'd give to you, but this person wanted the money, and so it's okay. And this person offered you more, they'll understand, you know, it's okay. It's like, it's not about that. I told them they could have the property, I'm going to keep my word. It's about doing the right thing. It's not about making money. Another person told me, and I said, where were you when I needed you? They said, why didn't you tell them you were going to sell the property to them, but you are going to split the difference with the people who lost the property? I like, I didn't even think of that. Where were you when I needed you? They probably wouldn't have accepted that offer anyway, because they wanted the land. But anyway, listen, this is the important thing to think about. <coughs> I had to make a choice, didn't I? Somebody was going to be mad. No. Either I was going to disobey God and go back on my word, and then I would be upsetting God and uh, damaging my reputation as a Christian, and those people would be upset at me and feel betrayed because I promised the property to them, or I was going to make this rich person mad. <coughs> Somebody was going to be mad. Listen, decisions made for money will conflict with decisions made for God. I had to choose. And listen, that's a, not an isolated incident. Those things happen all the time. Somebody will offer you money, try to get you to do something that goes against the Bible. And any time you want to make money, you are offered money, and the only condition is you have to disobey God. You have to choose. You cannot serve two masters. You will hate the one and love the other, or hold the one and despise the other. You have to choose. No man can serve two masters. You have to choose. Are you going to live to obey God and use your finances for what God tells you to use your finances for? Or are you going to live for money and do what makes money for you instead of serving God? You have to choose. You will have to choose. Whichever one you choose, there's going to be conflict. There's going to be a problem. Either you're going to be in conflict with God or you're going to be in conflict with the situation with the money. But either way, you are going to have to choose. We must choose and we will serve. Choosing involves priorities. Serving two masters is not an option. You cannot serve God and mammon. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this reminder. It's a sobering truth, but it's real. We live in this world, and it is a battleground, and we have to choose what we're going to do. And no matter what, we're going to be in conflict with someone. Father, I pray that today the congregation here will decide to serve God and not money. So if you are here today and this message has spoken to you, maybe there's something I mentioned that brought something to your mind, or maybe there's something that I didn't even think of that the Lord is just pointing out. The Holy Spirit is working in your heart and saying, there's an area here where you're choosing money instead of God. Or there's a decision that you're about to make. There may be a decision coming up in the next week or in the next month where you are going to have to choose between God and money. I pray that you'll respond to this message and you'll say, God, I am going to choose you over money. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I lost everything I owned. It doesn't matter what happens to me in the physical world. I am going to obey the Bible. I'm going to choose God. I am going to say what Joshua said. 
As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.